Hey, welcome back to Cool Classics. Today we're going to take a look at the life and career of Eartha Kitt. You might know her from playing Catwoman on the Batman 66 TV series or from one of her many hit songs. She's multi-talented. I have some cool clips and some freaky facts. But first, I have to give you a trigger warning. We are going to touch on some very sensitive subjects early on. I compiled all of this information by watching multiple interviews with Eartha herself, along with interviews by her daughter, Kit Shapiro. This might be a little bit different of a video for me, but I'm going to do my best to try and put it all in a chronological order. Here we go. She was born Eartha May Keith, January 17th, 1927, in North South Carolina. Now, this information wasn't even known to Eartha until 1998. Now, the truth that Eartha did know about her birth was that she was born on a cotton plantation, and her mother, Annie May Keith, was of Cherokee and African descent. One day, Eartha's mother, Annie, told her family that she had been sexually assaulted by the white plantation owner's son. Now, everyone kept it quiet out of fear, but when Eartha was born, they could tell she was of mixed race and had lighter skin than everyone else in the family. Annie ended up leaving the plantation and she took baby Eartha with her. She eventually met this black man and the two of them moved in together and started to build a life. Now around the time that Eartha turned two years old, it started to be obvious to this man that Eartha was of mixed race and he didn't like that. There was a stigma attached to that even in the black community. So by the time she was three years old, he had had enough. And he said, either you get rid of Eartha or both of you can leave. And so Annie took Eartha and gave her to her Aunt Rosa. Now living with Aunt Rosa, things went from bad to worse. Aunt Rosa also had a man who didn't like the fact that Eartha was of mixed race. He also made fun of her for being illegitimate. And this is the first time she heard this term, but he would refer to her as yellow. So being treated like she's second class by the adults, rubbed off onto the other children in the house, some of which who were like three and four years older than her, all the way up to 10 years older. Well, they thought that she wasn't worth anything. What started out as just picking on her turned into real physical abuse by the other children. This continued on for a few more years, and then Eartha got the news. Her mother Annie had passed away. Eartha said that after that, everyone felt like they could do anything they wanted to her without any repercussions. The adults put her to work at seven years old, back in the cotton field that her mother was in. She also says, at this point, the older children switched from just physical abuse to the worst kind of abuse. At this point, I was nothing but a worker and a toy to be used. This continued on for quite a while, and eventually it started to take a mental toll and a physical toll on Eartha. Until one day, a different family member was there, and they caught wind of what was really happening to Eartha. They immediately tried to contact a family member in New York, but they had no way of doing it other than sending letters, and they kept sending them, and one of them said, you have to save this little girl. If you don't, they're going to kill her. Well, that letter found its destination. The woman in New York City contacted the family and demanded that they send Eartha to live with her right now. Of course, the family was reluctant, but after being threatened, and then of course she gave them some money, they put her on a train and sent her off with just the clothes on her back and a can of sardines. Now, Eartha says that by this time, she had stopped speaking for almost a year, and she was very malnourished. So when she arrived in New York, she was super skinny and scared. She stepped off the bus, was looking around, and this really tall woman started walking towards her. But as she got closer, she could tell she looked very regal and nice. And the woman looked down at her and said, Are you Eartha? Eartha, in her little scared voice, said, Yes. And the woman reaches down, grabs her by the hand, and says, You'll come with me now. Leaving there, Eartha was looking around, and everything seemed so different. And before long, they were in Manhattan in a beautiful home. And the woman asked, 
Would you like something to eat? And Eartha said, I have to go potty. The woman walked her over to a door, opened it, and said, Go in there. Eartha stepped in, the woman closed the door, and in Eartha's mind, she was being punished and put in a closet. She looked around, didn't know what to do, so she sat on the floor. Eventually, the woman opens the door to check on Eartha, and there she is sitting on the floor. And she asks her, didn't you go potty? And Eartha shook her head like, no. And the woman said, why not? And Eartha said, I don't know how. The woman broke down in tears. She said, my poor, poor dear, here, let me help you. And she showed her how to use the toilet. Then she showed her how to wash her hands in the sink. You see, Eartha had never been anywhere but in that house and in the cotton field. She had never seen indoor plumbing or a toilet before. She had to learn all of this. And from that moment on, it was like night and day. This woman changed her life. Her name was Mamie Kitt, and her skin color looked just like Eartha's, but her facial features and body structure was definitely Cherokee Indian. She went on to enroll Eartha in school, and she spent a lot of time teaching her about her African ancestry and her Native American ancestry. She also wanted Eartha to be very versed in all the cultures that New York City had to offer. So if there was an Irish parade or a German festival, they would make sure they went and took part in all the song and dance and food. And they would often go into Spanish Harlem and do the same thing there. Eartha said that she really enjoyed this. It was like she was getting an education in their culture, but at the same time having fun and becoming part of their community too. Mamie would also pay people that they befriended at these festivals to help teach Eartha their languages. And Eartha became very fluent in German, Dutch, French, and Spanish. Now, one of the first things that Mamie taught Eartha how to do was play the piano. And Eartha caught on fast. So fast that they had to change piano instructors twice because Eartha was outgrowing them, skill-wise. This really excited Mamie who then started to envision Eartha as a concert pianist. Now, Eartha was still quiet and reserved when around strangers, but when she started taking poetry lessons, that kind of changed. She had to recite poems in front of the classroom, and that's when she became a little bit more outgoing, and this allowed her to audition for a high school. Her audition consisted of her reciting poetry and playing the piano, and she was accepted into now what is known as the High School of Performing Arts in Manhattan. Now, a couple years later, Eartha was hanging out with her friend Joyce from school, and on the weekends, they would always go down to where there were still a few vaudeville houses, and for one price, you could see a vaudeville show and then go watch a movie, and that's what they would do on Saturdays. Well, one day the two of them walked out of the theater and they had just seen the movie Stormy Weather. It starred Lena Horne, Cab Calloway, and the Catherine Dunham dance troupe. So they're standing in front of the theater thinking, hmm, we still have a dime left. We could go back in and buy some chocolate. But if we do that, we have to walk home. Or we could take the dime and go down to the subway. You know, big decision here, right? Chocolate and walk home. <laughs> and then next thing you know, she said this girl comes walking up to her. It looked about the same age. And she said she had the same skin complexion as me. And she comes up and says, do you know where the Max Factor makeup store is? Now, Eartha said what she was thinking in her mind, she blurted out. What is a girl your age with a skin complexion of mine going to do with the makeup? And the girl said, it's not for me. It's for Catherine Dunham. And then ding, a little bell went off with Eartha. And she's like, you know Catherine Dunham? And the girl said, yes, she's my teacher and I want to take her a present. Well, Eartha didn't miss a chance and she said, I'll show you where the makeup store is if you can introduce me. Well, this girl said, okay, come on, let's go. And she actually had a car. So the two of them hopped in and rode with her to the makeup store and then ended up at the Catherine Dunham Dance Academy. Well, when they get there, the place is kind of busy. There's a lot of stuff going on, like auditions, and there's going to be a recital that night. So Catherine's pretty busy, but they hang around and eventually get a chance to meet her. So Catherine ends up asking Eartha where she goes to school, and Eartha says the High School of the Performing Arts. 
And Catherine goes, oh, are you a dancer there? Eartha says, no, I play the piano and I'm studying poetry. And Catherine goes, oh, so you're not here to audition? And Eartha laughs and says, no, I just seen your movie. And then we ran into this girl and she tells her the whole story. Well, Catherine gets a kick out of all this. And she says, well, you are free to audition if you'd like. And her friend Joyce is going, do it, do it, get up there, audition. And she goes, but I don't really know a dance. I've never had dance lessons. And she goes, do you know how to dance? And she said, street dance. And she goes, well, get up there and street dance. So Eartha walks up on this stage and there's a man at a piano and he asks her, what kind of music would you like? And she said, something Spanish. And so he starts playing this song and Eartha walks over to him and reaches down and says, no, I want to hear this song. And she starts playing it. And he goes, oh, okay, I know that one too. And so he starts playing it. Eartha kicks off her shoes and starts dancing. Now, Eartha knew this song from the Spanish Harlem festivals. And every time it would get to like the chorus area, Eartha started singing out the chorus in Spanish. Then as the song went on, Eartha changed it up and started singing it in French. When the song finally ended, Catherine stood up and said, you are accepted into this school. Eartha said, what? And Catherine walked over and said, you girl are a singer and a dancer. Well, Eartha was excited, and by the time they got home, she was scared. Now she had to tell Aunt Mamie what was going on. But before she even got home, she knew she was in trouble because it was pretty late. And when she walked in the door, it was, where have you been? What's going on? Everybody's been looking for you. They've been looking for Joyce. Everyone is calling each other. You're way past curfew and all this stuff. Well, Eartha goes in to tell her everything that happened. Well, they're happy that she's okay and she's excited, but no, that is not an option. You are a pianist and you are staying in your school. Well, that night, Eartha can't sleep. She's thinking about this the whole time and her heart tells her she has to go to the Catherine Dunham School. The next day, though, is piano lessons at the house. And when they wake up, everybody's getting ready for the lessons and Eartha springs it again. I don't want to do this. I want to go to that school. I want to be a singer and a dancer. Well, this upset Mamie, and this is the first time she's seen her get so upset. She'd never seen her lose her temper. Eventually, after Eartha saying, I don't even want to play the piano anymore, Mamie lost it. She said, fine, we'll just cancel the piano lessons and throw everything away that you've worked so hard for. And she picked up the piano stool and threw it on the ground and walked away. And Eartha was like, oh my God. Well, Eartha felt horrible about this because she loved Mamie, but she didn't want to continue with piano lessons. She wanted to go to this school. So the next day she went back there and told them what had transpired. Catherine told her, you need to make the decision. Don't let any of us sway this for you. But I am offering you a full scholarship. People have donated money for future talents and you are one of them. Eartha said, but I can't just switch schools and expect everything to stay normal at home. And that's when they said, maybe you should move out. And Eartha said, how can I do that? They said, well, the scholarship comes with $10 a week in cash for you. Eartha then said, but I don't know how to live on my own and find a place and figure all this out. This other girl said, if you give me $5 a week, you can live with me. I already have a place. So Eartha decided to chase her dreams. She moved out and joined the Catherine Dunham School and she stayed there for four years. Now in the mornings she would go in and study ballet, then it was time for math and English, and then back to more dance, music theory, vocal lessons, things like that. Now eventually things did get a little bit harder for Eartha. She had to get herself a part-time job because her friend moved out and Eartha couldn't afford the place immediately by herself. She actually slept on the roof for a week just till she saved up enough money to get her own place in the building. 
Now, Eartha could have went and asked her Aunt Mamie for some financial help during this time, but she didn't want to do that. It was a pride thing. She wanted to do this on her own, and she did. Now, her and Aunt Mamie, their relationship never really dissolved. They were very active in each other's lives, so much so that Eartha was using her last name Kit as her own. And when Eartha was old enough and could legally change her name, she adopted the name Kit out of love and respect for her Aunt Mamie. Now, by 1948, Eartha had graduated and was now a full-time member of the dance troupe. So when they got the call that they needed dancers for a movie called Casbah, starring Avanda Carlo and Tony Martin, well, Eartha got to make her big screen debut. Although it was just a small, uncredited clip, here she is dancing. Check this out. Her next big break came in 1950 while performing with the dance troupe one night. Orson Welles was in attendance and was just blown away by her singing and dancing, along with her beauty. He asked her if she would like to star as Helen of Troy in his Broadway production of Dr. Faustus. And of course she did, and wow did this bring her some notoriety. Now as the series ran on Broadway, Orson Welles and Eartha became very close, almost like they were dating, but they really weren't. She says it wasn't a sexual relationship, although it could have been if she would have let it or pursued that herself. But Orson Welles was enamored with her beauty and talent and the way she would always ask questions about things. And she said, I was always asking questions about how do you get these productions? How do you write the scripts? Uh, what about radio, television? How do you get the funding? How does all this work? And he was just in love with the fact that I would ask all these questions and showed me everything. I would go to dinner meetings with producers. I would talk to the rest of the camera crews with him. I was just soaking up all the information and he was getting a kick out of showing me everything. She said that when it was all said and done, she learned so much about how the industry and show business in general worked, along with a little bit about love and life because the two of them really did care for each other and she would say they loved each other. Now, Eartha's time on Broadway did not go unnoticed. In fact, she made the all-star team. That's what this is kind of considered. It's called the New Faces Of. And so the New Faces of 1952 are the up-and-coming, most impactful people on Broadway. Well, Eartha Kitt, of course, along with Paul Lind, who played Uncle Arthur on Bewitched and was very popular on the Hollywood Squares. Alice Ghostly, who was also on Bewitched, Mayberry RFD, Good Times, Designing Women. Robert Clary, who went on to play Corporal Louis Lebeau on Hogan's Heroes. Carol Lawrence, who went on to create the character Maria for the West Side Story musical. She also took part in hiring James Dean to play the lead of Tony. Unfortunately, he died in a car crash before he could play the part. As a matter of fact, Eartha had been given James dance lessons for over a month in preparation for his role in the musical. Now, during this time, Eartha started following Orson Welles' advice. She started to branch out and brand herself. So not only was she performing on Broadway, she also was giving dance lessons and performing in nightclubs singing. Now, one time when she was on tour with the Catherine Dunham dance troupe in Istanbul, Turkey, she heard this song playing in a bar. She learned it and she brought it back to the United States and recorded it. Of course, Eartha added her own style to it. She sang the verse in English and the chorus in Turkish, and the song was called Uskadara. It means a fat man usually has a belly like a percolating coffee pot. The song started being played on New York radio stations and quickly spread across the country, climbing all the way to number 23 on the U.S. Hot 100 chart. 
All of a sudden, Eartha Kitt is a recording artist. Not only that, but the New Faces of 1952 was turned into a movie. And of course, she plays her part. She also released her second song, Sessy Bong, and she recorded it in five different languages. But it was the U.S. version that had multiple languages mixed together that climbed all the way to number eight on the Hot 100. Now, all of this is happening right around 1953, and you can tell she has already developed her cat style. She's moving like a cat. There are lots of pictures of her holding cats, and she's already purring like a cat. Her next song is released in the New Faces movie, so it has a music video built right in for it. And oh, it is stunning. It's called Santa Baby. I'll wait up for you, dear Santa Baby, and hurry down the chimney tonight. The song was an international success, charting in France, Germany, and the UK, while reaching number four on the U.S. Hot 100 charts for the holiday season of 1953. Eartha wasn't going to miss her chance, so she put together a touring band and they started booking shows in large clubs and small theaters throughout the country. As the tour continued on into 1954, she released three more singles that all cracked the U.S. Top 20 charts. The crowd started to become larger, the shows became more frequent, and she was known as the sultry, sexy kitten. Now, the guys in the audience loved this, but their wives were starting to take exception because Eartha would actually come down to their tables or out into the crowd and sit on guys' laps, put her arms around them, sometimes grab the guy's hand and put it on her maybe chest or butt or thighs. And this wasn't going over too well with their wives. A few times, their wife or girlfriend jumped up and attacked Eartha. Now this made headlines, which made more people want to come to the show. So it was good for business, but not good for Eartha. So she quickly learned to put a disclaimer at the beginning of her performance. She would say, Ladies, I'm not here to steal your man. Tonight, I'm just going to rev his engine up for you later on. Now, it wasn't just the men in her audience that thought she was beautiful. It was also the leading actors in Hollywood. All of a sudden, they were requesting her to be in their movies. They wanted Eartha Kitt on their arm. One of those men was Sidney Portier. He had her co-star with him in The Mark of the Hawk. Now, he was so infatuated with Eartha that he was constantly pressuring her into starting to date, have sex, and become his woman. But there was a problem. He was married, and Eartha said, no way. And this caused a lot of drama. My eyes are wet, and I know I have been crying in my sleep. For it seems that you have turned even from me. And then just one year later, Sammy Davis Jr. had her co-star with him in Anna Lucasta. And the same sort of scenario happened. A little bit different, but a lot more drama. When she said no, things got crazy. What are you leading up to? Look, I'll give it to you straight, baby. Home without a woman in it is just a pile of cold bricks. Now, what do you say me and you get together, huh? Are you asking me to marry you, Danny? Well, something like that. I'll have to make a separate video for those two incidences, so look for it on my Cool Quotes channel. So the 1950s were Eartha's biggest years. She was on a constant tour, just non-stop. She was also releasing one or two singles every year. And she appeared in at least one movie every year also. It was just go, go, go. She was in demand. Now, by the late 1950s, Eartha had generated so much publicity that it really wasn't a shock when some of the other children who were now grown up from the same household that abused her reached out to her and asked her for some help. So Eartha you know, considered them the good ones, and one of them was also abused. So she went ahead and did what she could to better their lives. Unfortunately, it didn't stop there. 
Now, one evening after a nightclub performance, Eartha went down by the exits like she normally did, and she would thank people and greet them on their way out. When all of a sudden, this man starts pushing his way through the crowd, and he's yelling, Eartha, Eartha, my family, my family. She looks up at this man standing right in front of her, and she realizes that this is the grown-up version of the teenage boy that used to do the worst abuse to her. Now, some people may have crumbled in this in fear and panic attack, but not Eartha. She did the opposite. She went on the attack verbally. She said, how dare you show your face here to me after all you've done? And she spilled all the beans and yelled at this guy until he left out of there running. But unfortunately, the press was there. The local newspaper reporter told this story in his review of her show, and then the surrounding papers reprinted it. And then it started spreading and changing. Before you knew it, it was tabloid news. The headlines start to read, Eartha Kitt yells at her family to leave her alone. Eartha Kitt refuses to see her family ever again. Eartha Kitt hates her family. And, but they never mentioned the abuse. It just sort of got dropped and it became a spin to where Eartha was the bad person. All of a sudden, Eartha's caught up in all this drama. And she decides, I'm just going to keep telling the truth. So anytime she was questioned or interviewed about this, she would go ahead and tell her life story all the way down to the abuse that she suffered. Eartha says that most of the time, the reporters would stop writing or turn their tape recorder off when she got to the abuse part. It was just too much for them. Other times, the newspaper or magazines left that section out and it definitely never made any television interviews. Now, the times were different back then, she says. People didn't talk about this, and that's why abuse continues on. You have to talk about it. Now, in 1960, Eartha married John McDonald, and in 1961, the two of them had a daughter, and she named her Kit. Some people thought, you named your daughter Kit, Kit? And she says, no, I am Eartha, she is Kit, and she completes me. It was also a way for her to carry on the Kit name out of respect for her Aunt Mamie. So at this point, Eartha becomes what you would call like a super mom. She's fully devoted to her daughter. So anywhere she went, her daughter went. But she also tried to cut down on a lot of traveling so that she could stay rooted in one place with her daughter. That meant she went into television more. That way you could just stay in the Hollywood area and work on TV shows. Here she is on Burke's Law, episode Who Killed the Rest? And the police chief Alvaro that you see right there, that is Cesar Romero who went on to play the Joker on the Batman 66. And of course, Earth is in here too. She's a scientist from New York who's hiding out playing a witch doctor, but she gets busted. Many people, they tell me the love potions you make, they are like dynamite. You've got me wrong, muchacho. I'm not a witch lady. Now in 1965, Eartha and John got divorced, and their daughter Kit ended up living with Eartha. So Eartha hired a nanny to help so that Eartha could go out and continue to find work. And she was going on television shows and she got into the whole spy genre that was happening. Here she is on the show, I Spy. But look who is tied and handcuffed to the bed. It's Bill Cosby. Isn't that freaky? Just cut the laces in the back. Nobody will know the difference. Come on, will you? How do you know my name? What? My name. I don't know you. Listen, how can I hurt you? Look, like a bug in a pen. I don't know nothing. I don't see nothing. Oh, no, sir. I don't know, man. That was kind of creepy. Now, she also played on the Mission Impossible TV series episode, The Traitor. And in this one, she played a safe cracker, which was kind of foreshadowing her next role on the Batman 66 TV series, playing Catwoman. Saints preserve us. It's Catwoman. In the adorable fur. Holy crucial moment. Most apt. Boy blunderer. 
Eartha was brought in to play Catwoman on season three, and that's the season that almost didn't happen. They also brought in a new character called Batgirl, played by Yvonne Craig, and in my video that I made on her, I go into all the facts about season three. How can Batgirl be the best anything when Catwoman is around? The queen of criminals, the princess of plunder, yours untruly. In any comparison between Batgirl and myself, she runs a poor third. Bringing both of them in brought in a lot of sexy and a lot of talent. They could sing, they could dance, and they could deliver their lines with their own unique flavor. After all, Eartha was already known as a Catwoman, so now she's purring as the Catwoman of Batman. Let no one say that Catwoman is not the best dressed woman in the world. She may be evil, but she is attractive. You'll know more about that in a couple of years. Perfectly foolproof. And you, Catwoman, are an even bigger fool than I thought you were. Angora, gag her. You will make a perfect pinafore. The type of garment no one will recognize you in or as. <laughs> here we are on Pussyfoot Road. And here, where Batman has been invited by Queen Bess for a private audience at three o'clock. I hereby remit myself to your muscular custody. <laughs> And one of her partners in crime on the show was the Joker, played by Cesar Romero, whom she just starred in Burke's Law with. Get in this car or I'll blow whatever little brains you have out. Essayez de trouver une pierre plantée dans la terre. Oh, that's the first time I ever heard a cat purr in French. I swear, the role of Catwoman was made for her. Or she was made for it. You can tell because she was only on there one season, and we all still think of her from that role. Now, starting in the late 50s all the way through the 60s, Eartha had been for the Civil Rights Movement, and she was anti-Vietnam War, and she was creating a lot of philanthropic projects and helping a lot of underprivileged people. And this all came to a head in 1968 when she was invited to the White House. She attended a luncheon with the president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and his wife, the first lady, Lady Bird Johnson. And the first lady asked Eartha, what would you suggest we do to help keep kids from becoming hippies and smoking pot? Eartha quickly replied, well, you send the best young people of this country off to be shot and maimed, so it's no wonder that the kids rebel and smoke pot. She said the children of America are not rebelling for no reason. They're not smoking pot and becoming hippies because they're happy. They don't want to take part of a system that's going to possibly send them to the other side of the world to kill or be killed. The impoverished people of color are living as second-class citizens, but they're treated first-class when it comes to being drafted. There are so many things burning the people of this country, particularly the mothers. With all due respect, we feel we are going to raise sons so that they can be sent to war by your husband. Well, the first lady burst into tears, and the president was not happy. After Eartha left, this was a big to-do. All the newspapers were talking about it, and all of the ones that were Democratic on the side of Lyndon Baines Johnson all started running hit pieces on her. Now that's something that she's used to, but this seemed really orchestrated. The whole Democratic committee was pulling strings and making sure that she was smeared everywhere. But something else was happening. She couldn't quite figure it out. All of a sudden, Every contact she had in Hollywood stopped talking to her. From that moment on, 1968 to 1972, she got absolutely no work. Now, she could still go out and tour as herself, but no one in television or the movies would touch her or even answer her calls. And then, in 1973, she got a small little uncredited part in a TV movie, and I guess the word came down, stop. And all of a sudden, she's back blacklisted. Now, she couldn't prove this. 
her manager, everybody couldn't figure out because no one would admit to why they wouldn't talk to them anymore. You know, how can you really prove that you're blacklisted when no one will talk? So what does Eartha do? Well, she continues to do her thing. She says, I spoke the truth, and that's what I always do, and I suggest everyone do that. You let the cards fall where they may. Usually they fall in your favor, but this time, I don't know, but I'm not going to panic. Eartha adopted this philosophy. It's sort of like pay it forward. So her 1970s were spent performing as herself in theaters. And after a few shows, she made sure that she went out and did a few free, non-charging, beneficial, helpful acts of kindness. And that could be like showing up for a fundraiser, performing here for a benefit, or helping like someone get some money to build a school or a hospital. Now she did this worldwide and she brought her daughter Kit with her the whole time. She had a nanny and a tutor with them and they went ahead and traveled everywhere. So if they went into like France and performed three shows, then she also had three benefits or fundraisers lined up to do also. Now this continued on for years. Now one time they went to South Africa during apartheid to help raise funds to build schools for these underprivileged children. And the first day they were there, They let her daughter, Kit, go to the local amusement park with the nanny. Now, her daughter had so much fun, she came back and wanted her mom to go with her the next day. So, Eartha went along. They entered the park in a group of people, and everything seemed normal. But when they got to the first ride and Eartha and her daughter sat down, well, an attendant walked over and said, Ma'am, this is for whites only. You cannot be in this ride. Now, her daughter was a teen at this point and knew all about racism, and she started to go off. But Eartha said, hush, don't panic. Everything will be okay. And Eartha gets up and says, you can ride the ride. I will wait for you. And the daughter says, oh, heck no. So she gets up too. As they go walking away, her daughter wants to turn around and yell a few things. Now, again, Eartha restates, no, now is not the time. But then her daughter asks, When will the time be? And Eartha says, We will know. Eartha said that two days later, she's at the grand opening of the new school, and everyone is there. She's going to cut the ribbon, and all of the biggest donators and supporters are standing up on the stage. Out in the audience are a lot of people, and the newspapers and local television stations. So they go along and they introduce each person and their contribution. And right next to her is this man. And when they get to him, they say that he is the largest contributor to the school. And he is the owner of the amusement park. Eartha's daughter is in the crowd. She looks down there and sees her, gives her a little nod, like this is the time. And so she turns and takes the microphone and says, oh, so that is your amusement park? And she points over her shoulder and you can see the roller coasters and Ferris wheels in the background. He says, yes, it is. And she says, well, I went there yesterday with my white looking daughter and they told me that she could ride rides, but I couldn't because I was black. And boy, this white man turned red. He was real flustered, didn't know what to do. So he said, that will never happen again. And she says, good, I hope it doesn't. And he says, I will make this up to you and everyone. And she says, oh, so you're going to build another school with us and maybe donate double the money so we can get it done in half the time? And he said, yes, I am. And you can come to the amusement park with me tomorrow and we will make a change. Eartha said that right then she knew she had picked the correct time to speak up. And she kind of let him out of the hot seat. She didn't bring it up anymore in front of the press. And the next day, he took her, her daughter, and a whole entourage of people into the park. And before they even got there, all of the signs that said whites only rides were gone. And the park was now open to everyone. Now, back home in the United States, things were changing there too. The New York Times had uncovered a bunch of leaked CIA files and dossiers, and one of them was on Eartha Kitt. When they contacted her and told her about the contents of this dossier, Eartha wasn't really shocked. And when they asked her for a comment on this, she said, Well, the truth is finally out there, and we should always tell the truth 
and search for the truth. The New York Times went ahead and printed the contents of the Eartha Kitt dossier along with the other ones that were political enemies of Lyndon Baines Johnson and things changed for the better for her. Jimmy Carter, who was the current president at the time, invited Eartha to the White House where he apologized for his party's participation in having her blacklisted and he said, it's great to have you back. So as the 1980s began, Eartha started to reappear on television and in movies. And in 1983, she released a song called Where Is My Man? And it reached number seven on the U.S. dance chart. Her daughter Kit grew up and transitioned into becoming her manager, where for decades they continued with the same philosophy. Every time you would put on a show and be rewarded, you would go out and do a good deed. The internet is filled with pictures and testimonials from people and organizations that directly benefited from Eartha helping them with her charitable contributions. Her daughter is keeping her mother's legacy alive through a website called Simply Eartha. She's also active on social media and even has a YouTube channel called Kit Shapiro. Now sadly, in 2008, Eartha developed inoperable colon cancer and as her health started to decline, she was released from the hospital to spend her final days at home. She wanted to make it till Christmas, and she did. She passed away December 25th, 2008, at home with her daughter and family beside her. She was 81 years old. This was the hardest video for me to make yet. I mean, her early life, my God what she overcame, and there's just so much more that I couldn't put in this video. It would have been an hour and a half long and taken three months to make. I'll tell a couple more of her stories over on my Cool Quotes channel, so go ahead and look for that. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. Let me know, did you ever get the privilege to meet Eartha Kit? That would have been amazing. And I'll be back with more characters from the Batman TV series and all my other favorites right here on Cool Classics.